All right, so making history. Um, I think what drives me uh, most is that I'm a storyteller. Uh, you know, as an artist, um, I have the luxury of a lot of mediums. I can draw, I can paint, I can sculpt, I can write. Um, but sculpting is the thing that I love the most. And so uh, when I first discovered that I could sculpt, um, it occurred to me that maybe God wanted me to do something different with my gifts. And so I became, quote unquote, a creative steward of our nation's memory. This is the piano that I made for August Wilson's play, The Piano Lesson. And so the idea is to create public art that conveys unvarnished truth. Because when I first started sculpting 25 years ago now, um, one of the first things that I realized is that there is very little public art that represents people of color. If it's not in the name of diversity, like the Vietnam War Memorial, or something like that, it's just, you just don't see Black people being depicted as people. Usually when you see them, there are, for instance, icons like Frederick Douglass, Sajona Truth, Harriet Tubman. But what about the rest of the people? And so, um, I decided that it was really important to elevate the culture of marginalized people. This is uh, legacies at uh, Chickasaw Heritage Park in Memphis. And so uh, it's ironic that my first public artwork also is the first public artwork of a contemporary African-American woman to be commissioned by a municipality in the United States. I didn't know that when I first began. I just wanted to make a sculpture that represented my community. I live in Yonkers. Um, Yonkers has quite a bit to, to, to kind of blow their horn about, but Ella Fitzgerald was an international music icon. Everybody loved her. And uh, you know, I said to the city, we should celebrate her. We should celebrate her first. She grew up here. And so luckily the city of Yonkers uh, agreed. And so uh, amazingly, the first sculpture of a contemporary African-American woman went into the ground only 24 years ago. So my style, of course, is defined by candid portraiture. This is Temba the Boatman for uh, the Enslaved Africans Rain Garden, which is an urban heritage sculpture garden that I'm developing for Yonkers. It'll be constructed in the spring. I use bas-relief techniques. Um, and again, the idea is to help drive a story. Um, to the side of the piano. It just gives me a little bit more room to say more uh, about whatever story that I'm telling. And so viewers are moved by narrative, you know, and facial expressions and body language humanize um, the artwork. And this is one of the things that occurred to me very, very early on, you know, as I listen to people respond to my work and say different things. Um, what I understood was that my artworks have a soul and people can tell. And so I use montages and symbols and text, and this all creates visual intrigue. It gives you a reason to look at the artwork and to begin to wonder about what this story is about. And as I said, you know, my subjects have souls and they have a way of speaking to the viewer. And I know this based on the kinds of things that people say back to me. Um, one of the other things that's important to me is that I've discovered that monuments can create intimacy with the viewer. There are lots of ways to engage people visually, um, to make them look, to hold their eye. Um, and, and in this process, they learn things very quickly that they might not have had an opportunity to learn before. So I find public art really accessible. I mean, you can walk into a public place at any time and walk out knowing a whole lot that you didn't know beforehand. So in this particular instance, um, I am telling the story of enslaved Africans in Yonkers, which is very interesting because the Phillips family who created the slave trade here, um, these were the people who were furnishing slaves and enslaved Africans um, for the better part of the county. They owned the county, 54,000 acres of land. And so it's a very interesting story. Um, and again, it gave me a lot of room for showing the story visually. And again, the idea is to have the artwork be engaging. It's not enough just to create something pretty. You wanna create something that's functional, that, that you know, people will engage, wanna take pictures, 
want to look at, want to understand why is this here? How did this get to be here? What is this about? What does it mean to me? And so um, with that comes what I call civic engagement. So, you know, over the years, uh, and particularly the last dozen years or so, um, while I'm creating public art, I invite local college students, high school students, elementary schools um, to come into the studio to talk about the subject, but also to have an opportunity to see public art in progress. Most people don't know sculptors and most people don't get to see quote unquote statues being made. So for many, it's, it's a really intriguing process. And again, uh, you know, I often have parties, I call them previews, you know, in my house where I'll have, you know, easily a hundred people passing through just to have an opportunity to see the artwork before it's cast, um, you know, to get an idea of what it looks like and to tell me how it makes them feel. And all this helps me to be centered, you know, when I'm coming up with concepts for art for public places, because public art is not curatorial art. Public art is about expressing the voice of the community trying to tell stories about the community. It's, it's, for me, it's site specific because usually I'm dealing with history, which is usually grounded in matters of fact. The challenge with African-American history is that um, oftentimes it's distorted, it's, it's incorrect, or it just hasn't been documented. So again, it gives me an opportunity to be able to tell untold stories um, in a very effective way. Um, I also believe in destination learning an opportunity to teach children stories um, about history, as well as in, when you're talking about slavery, you wanna talk about civility. Um, I lived in Columbia, Maryland, where civility actually is part of the curriculum. And I wish everybody would incorporate that into their curriculums because this is how you breed healthy communities, teaching the young people what it means to be a good community member and how communities should work together and things like that. I think a lot of what we saw, as you say, with the election um, has to do with a, a lack of education. And so public art is a really cool way to do it quickly and effectively. And so we also have social media. And um, you know, I discovered really 10 years ago how powerful um, social media can be. You have access to people all over the world. Um, what really kind of blew me is how people from other countries that don't speak English want to talk about the work, that as human beings, they get the crux of the story. Does it matter to them that they don't speak the language, they can still feel the, the gravity of the story and where it's going. And also too, the other interesting thing about uh, social media that I learned is that um, in other places, people don't look at this as black art, they look at it as art about black culture, which is a little different. Um, and again, it gave me a great appreciation for the fact that art can transcend just about all of the boundaries, language boundaries, ethnicity, race, none of that seems to matter when you're dealing with art. And that makes it a really, really practical um, resource to use when you're trying to talk about history. And so, you know, the goal is to create public art that's dramatic and exciting ways. This is the, uh, the lighting for Victory. Uh, we wanted really, really amazing night lighting. So this is LED lights in the pavement, which I really hope we get to do. Um, so goals are to design memorable places. You know, If you're going to take the time to raise the money or if you're gonna take the time to spend the money after you've raised it, you, you wanna create a memorable place. Um, a place that is attractive, literally, where people want to come, where people want other people to come, you know, where when you go home, you can't wait to tell somebody about something really amazing that you saw today because you want them to see it too. This is the goal for good public art. And again, it's a question of where inspiration and innovation converge, things that people haven't seen before. And, you know, in this instance, I've really enjoyed working with architects, landscape, architects because again they're like putting on reading glasses for me they help me to see further better um, they magnify the story and, and make it intriguing and so um, i'm looking forward this is the original design for uh, again the enslaved africans rain garden um, the design has evolved somewhat but this is the general feel for it i'm going backwards okay um the other thing is to balance a narrative about enslaved Africans. For victory, it's about 
balancing the narrative about enslaved African women. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, J. Marion Sims uh, is considered the father of gynecology, and he got to be that way by experimenting on enslaved African women with no drugs, no painkillers. Um, and then, of course, after he figured everything else, he went to Europe and did it on white women with, well, drugs and painkillers. And so uh, the communities of Harlem and East Harlem spent 10 years getting that sculpture removed. And this is the sculpture that I intend to replace it with. Um, we are hoping uh, that the city of New York can recover enough in 2021 to lift the suspension because at this point, all public art has been suspended in New York City due to COVID-19. Um, but they were adamant that they were going to make the sculpture be a priority for 2021. So keep your fingers crossed on that. And so uh, this particular sculpture is a reminder of the oath, first do no harm. Um, again, this is an oath that doctors take and, and in the Hippocratic Oath, there actually is a clause that says you're not supposed to hurt women and children. And the fact that this doctor did, um, this is an opportunity to right a wrong. And so we're looking forward to getting that executed. Um, in the final analysis, public art is a reflection of a community's values. And so for instance, this is Sojourner Truth. Um, she is uh, installed up at the walkway over the Hudson on the Highland side. Um, and what makes this sculpture important is not so much that it's Sojourner Truth, although that's really important, but the fact that, you know, she was a native New Yorker at some point, you know, that she lived here and that we can claim her as ours. She's part of our history. And so that makes the sculpture have even more gravity in terms of the meaning to the community where it's installed. And thank you. That's pretty much my presentation. <laughs>